from New York, where the American stage begins, NBC presents Best Plays, transcribed with John Chapman. Best Plays, a series of hour-length dramas based on the famous theatrical books begun by the late Burns Mantle, now edited by the distinguished drama critic of the New York Daily News, John Chapman. Mr. Chapman. Good evening, and welcome to our new series of best plays. In any form of enterprise, we're told that it's best to put one's best foot forward, except maybe in dancing. This evening, however, I have an idea we're getting off on the right foot, because our best play is Lawrence Hausman's fine comedy drama, Victoria Regina. This play was one of the great successes of the seasons of 1935 and 36. It was a remarkable season. Victoria Regina would have been a fine play no matter who acted the title role. But it had the enormous good fortune to have in it Miss Helen Hayes, who was widely regarded as the first lady of the American theater. Miss Hayes' performance back in that good season was the outstanding one of the year. It was one of those rare things, a perfect impersonation. And now, in a moment or two, we shall be able to enjoy it again. Or Miss Hayes once more is going to play Queen Victoria. It will be quite a switch from her current Broadway success, Mrs. McThing, in which she acts a society woman who is forced by witchcraft to become the cleaning woman in a pool hall. As she did in the original production, Miss Hayes has this evening a distinguished company of fellow players. They include Carl Esmond, who created the role of Prince Albert in the London production of Victoria Regina, and Clarence Derwent, and the part of the Prime Minister, Disraeli. Our play begins now in Kensington Palace. The 20th of June, 1837. In the early hours of dawn, William IV of England lies dead at Buckingham Palace. And through the hushed and misty streets, two august messengers hurry on a high errand of state. The Lord Chamberlain and the Archbishop of Canterbury. Their destination, the Palace of Kensington. Why doesn't someone come? Curse these lazy footmen. I, I ask your grace's pardon. You had better knock, my lord. Wait, I think I hear him now. Who rings at this... Uh, oh, my lord. You, go at once to the Princess Victoria. Say that we'd like to see her at once. The Princess? Oh, my lord, her, her Royal Highness isn't up yet. Up? Of course she isn't up. Send and have her wakened. Our business is urgent. Yes, my lord. Hurry, man. Yes, Your Grace. But I'll have to call her Royal Highness's maid first. Well, call her then. Uh, yes, Your Grace. <laughs> what a household. Uh, we shall have a wait, Your Grace. I'm told the Princess sleeps with her mother... The Duchess of Kent is a very determined character, I understand. Very determined, the old cat. Beg your pardon? Ah, I beg yours. Uh, your Grace has officiated before on a similar painful occasion, I believe. Yes, um, I announced his accession to his late Majesty King William. But then he was only in the next room waiting. How did he receive it? With alacrity. Well, well, said he. I shall make a better king than poor George. Mm, but he didn't, of course. Ah, no. A better character, but not a better king. But women are different. Uh, let's hope so, at any rate. This is an 18-year-old girl, Your Grace. A king would have been much better. Who, who knows, my lord? Heirs male of the last generation have not been a, a conspicuous success. Well, you must get her married at once. Her cousin, Prince George of Cambridge, would be very suitable. Yes, <laughs> I'm told the Duchess of Kent has other plans. Eh? Who? She has two nephews. The Princess of Saxe-Coburg, um, Ernst and Albert. Well, they won't do. They won't do at all. The blood is tainted. Indeed. Hemophilia, the bleeding sickness, won't do at all. And the foreign marriage, too. Uh, 
five o'clock. There's to be a council at ten. Uh, where? Here? It'll have to be. Wouldn't be decent for her to appear in public as yet. People might cheer. That girl's a long time coming. You mean the Queen? Uh, no, 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 of course not. My Lord Cunningham, and your grace. Madam. You have news for us. For Her Royal Highness we have news, madam. The king, then? He's dead. And my daughter is queen at last. And I, I am the queen mother. No, madam. No? Only had Your Royal Highness been queen in the first place, would that other title now follow. Oh, then if it is not mine, my lord, she shall give it to me. That, madam, I fear will be impossible. I will go myself and speak to her at once. That shall settle it. <sighs> Madam, we are here to see Her Majesty the Queen on urgent business, and we must not be delayed. If you would be so good... She is coming, my lord. Mama, what is it? Why is your grace here and your lordship? Your Majesty, it is our painful duty to announce to your Majesty... Uh, my daughter, she is queen. Queen. Mama, Mama... Oh, my child, my child. They came to tell me that I am queen. You are queen at last. Really queen now? Before I've been crowned? Yes. No, it won't. The king is dead. You are queen. Then my reign has already begun. I can do as I like? As you like. Do not mind what anyone says. If you want to do a thing, do it. But now, my love, do not stand there to catch cold. Come back to your own mother's bed. No, Mama, dear. As I may now do as I like, I wish in future to have a bed and a room of my own. Oh, your own? Yes, please, Mama. Ah, so you have been waiting for that. I should be very glad if you don't mind, now that I'm my own mistress. Yes, I would rather be alone. Mind? Glad? Alone? Look, what is to become of me? Eighteen hundred thirty-eight. The Queen is still in mourning, but she does not mourn. Animated and happy, she sits listening to what, in earlier youth, she was never allowed to hear. A conversation of a gentleman of breeding. Worldly, witty, and to a certain extent wise. Her Prime Minister, Lord Melbourne. And now, with your Majesty's permission, ma'am, let me come to affairs of state. Oh, pray do, Lord Melbourne. You said the other day, ma'am, with a courage which I thought remarkable in one so young, some day we must marry. Has Your Majesty given that matter any further thought? Oh, yes, Lord Melbourne. A great deal. Ah, I'm relieved to hear it. Then Your Majesty has still an open mind. An open mind? Oh, of course I shall make my own choice, Lord Melbourne. Oh, of course, ma'am. I wouldn't suggest otherwise for a moment. My marriage must be a marriage. Of affection. That, I am sure, can be arranged. And it must be someone I can respect, whom I can love and look up to. L look up to? Yes. I mean, eventually, when I have trained him for the position he will have to occupy. Ah, quite so. Mm. And now I have here with me a list of possibles. Oh, Lord Melvin, how interesting. How many? At present, ma'am, only five. But more are coming. I would like to see your list, Lord Melbourne. Uh, if Your Majesty will pardon me for a moment uh, while I explain the considerations. Oh, yes, do go on. First, a suitable consort for Your Majesty must, of course, be of royal blood. However, he must not be the heir to any foreign throne. But why not? Oh, political complications, ma'am. Uh, to proceed, he must be sufficiently young. He must know the English language or be capable of learning it and adapt himself to English customs and prejudice, since the English have a prejudice against foreigners. Do you dislike foreigners, Lord Melbourne? Oh, no, ma'am. But sometimes, for political reasons, one has to pretend to. Oh. Well, and what more? Well, he must have a certain amount of brains, but not too much. He must not expect to interfere in politics. Indeed, no. I should never allow it. Uh, finally, he must come of good stock. Good stock? I thought that meant cattle. <laughs> it, it does, ma'am, in certain connections. But it also means what passes from father to son. Uh, for that reason, acting under medical advice, I have not included two names which were first suggested to me. Your Majesty's cousins, their highnesses, Prince Ernest and Prince Albert. 
But they both looked quite strong and healthy when I saw them two years ago. Uh, yes, appearances, though, are sometimes deceptive. I have now the honor to present this list to Your Majesty. Oh. I don't know any of them. Well, Your Majesty knows one of them very well. Prince George of Cambridge, yes. But I couldn't marry Cousin George. He's so... so... Well, hmm? no one wishes to influence Your Majesty's choice. Lord Melbourne, I should not allow any influence in a matter of this kind. I see. I, I understand, ma'am. I only commend the matter to Your Majesty's good sense. The choice must be your own. Yes. But you haven't shown me any portraits. Uh, portraits, ma'am? But I can't decide about anyone until I know what they are like. Let Your Majesty send for each of them and see. Oh, I'm not going to send for them if I don't like the look of them. Of course I can get their portraits, but court painters, ma'am, know their duty. They only do what is expected of them. Here is a portrait that was sent to Mama the other day of my cousin, Prince Albert. Surely he must have grown very handsome. Hmm. It wouldn't be possible for a court painter to imagine anyone like that. You never know, ma'am. You never know. Well, am I to make a collection of portraits for your majesty? Oh, no, Lord Melvin. I wasn't speaking seriously when I said <laughs> that. No more was I, ma'am. But I do ask your majesty to think seriously. And now, uh, if I may take my leave. Indeed, Lord Melbourne, I pay great attention to everything that you say. Your Majesty is most gracious. Goodbye. Oh, Albert, Albert, Albert. Will you marry me? A few more months have passed, and in a sitting room in Windsor Castle, two young princes are deeply immersed in a discussion of the future. Well, Albert? Ja, Bruder? We must speak English. Why? For practice. One of us, you or I, will have to always. Yeah, I suppose so. Well, now, which of us do you suppose it is going to be? That is not for me to say. No? Well, then it is time that I speak. It must be me, Albert. Did not Papa tell you? Tell me? No. <laughs> Perhaps he found it difficult, but he wishes it shall be me. Then why did he make me come? <laughs> well, she has to choose. But she has to choose me. Why did Papa not tell me? I do not know. You were always our Mama's favorite. And perhaps that is why I am his. Do you remember our mamma at all, Albert? Oh, yes. I remember her. Just once. She was crying. She took me into her arms and cried. Well, you were very young when she went away from us. She wanted to take you with her. Did you know? When she went to Paris to live alone? Not alone. Albert. Suddenly I understand. You are not the son of my father. I... I am not... You are not the son of my father. That is why it has to be me. If she asks me, I shall accept. Then she shall not ask you. I shall have you sent home at once. Oh, I am not taking away from your happiness, Albert. You will be happier than I. Happiness is not everything. No? What then? To do something that shall be worth doing. You have only to do as you are told. Well, about that, we shall see. Cousin Al, Cousin Al, what are you two looking so serious about? Why, uh, the rain. Oh, but it will clear presently, and then we will go for a ride in the park. Well, that will be very nice, to be sure. Have you practiced your music yet, Cousin Al? At home, I was told you practice every day. Uh, yes, but here, uh, one cannot find the time. Go and do it now, and there will be time. Uh, but I tried one of the pianos the day we arrived, cousin. Uh, it was not in very good tune. But that doesn't matter. No one will hear you. Uh, uh, but generally, Albert and I practice together. Duets, you mean? 
But if the piano is out of tune, duets would sound dreadful. No, you go and practice by yourself, Ernst, and Albert shall practice by himself another time. Is it a command, cousin? Oh, my dear Ernst, I wouldn't think of commanding you. But I do want you to be quite at home here. And as you always practice at home, I want you to practice here. And now. Uh, well, very well, cousin. Uh, Albert, remember... How strangely Anne spoke to you then, Albert. You haven't been quarreling. We never quarrel, cousin. I think it would be very hard to quarrel with you, Albert. I couldn't. Please, don't ever try. Won't you sit down, Albert? No, not over there. Why don't you sit nearer? Talking is then so much easier. You're very kind, cousin. Ever since we came. Uh, to both of us, I mean. I am very fond of Albert. Yes, so am I. Would it be a great trial to you if you had to live away from him? One gets very fond of a brother. Yes. But one can get fonder of someone else, can one not? Albert, what are you doing? I was listening to Ernst practicing. Don't listen to Ernst. You must listen to me. Albert, I have something to say to you. Yes. What is it, cousin? In my position, it is I who have to say it. Unfortunately, ordinarily it is not what a woman would wish to say herself. She would rather he said it. Is there anything you wish me to say that I can say? To hear you say you can love me is all I can hope. Yet, if you could say you already do love me, that would be almost like heaven. I... I do love you, cousin. Enough to marry me? If it is still your wish when you know me, I will very gratefully and humbly accept this dear hand that you offer me. When I know you? Yes. For I have just learned something about myself. I have no proof. But something tells me that it is true. Don't tell me, Albert. If it's anything I shouldn't wish to know. But I must. It is this. My mother and my father, uh, that is, Ernst's father, separated after I was born. They did not love each other. My mother loved someone else. He was my father. Who was it? I don't know. So neither do I know who I am. Do you wish me to go now? No. No, I wish you to stay. It makes no difference to me. And besides, who knows? Ernst knows, and his father knows. But his father sent you here and let you come? Yes, but he hoped it would be Ernst. Oh, how could it possibly be Ernst after I'd seen you? Oh, Albert, Albert, what does it matter? It's not your father I shall marry. It is you. My very dear cousin. My sweet wife that is to be. Aren't you going to kiss me? If I may. Again, please, again. Now, we must be married quite soon, Albert. Everybody expects it. Expects it? But they don't know. Expects me to marry, I mean. I had to choose somebody. But I wasn't going to choose anybody. Not even Ernst? Oh, I liked Ernst very much from the first. I still do. He will be disappointed. Oh, well, we must both try to be very nice and kind to him. Then won't you send and say he may stop practicing? There is no need, for here he is. Come in. Uh, the rain has stopped. Are you ready to come riding, Em? Quite, if you are, cousin. Oh, yes, we are quite ready now. Everything has been settled. Tell him, Albert. Em, you told me to remember... I forgot. Albert, may I come in? 
Yes, dearest, if you wish. What are you doing? Shaving. Oh, how exciting! May I stay and watch you? If it would interest you, Vibchen. Oh, but of course. To see you shaving is wonderful. Something I never thought of. How often do you do it? Once a week? Every day. Oh. Is it dangerous? No. Not if you don't talk to me. Oh. Uh, Vicky. Vicky, if it weren't for the soup, I would kiss you now. The soup? Uh, uh, this thing on my face. Oh, not soup, darling. Soap. A soap, then. But I don't mind the soap, Albert. Your soap, if you would like to. Very well, then. I will. <laughs> Let me see what you shave with. <gasps> How sharp it is. Oh, it has to be sharp. Do you ever cut yourself? No. Not when I shave myself. I had a valet once who cut me badly one day. Oh, what happened? Then the court physician came running in a terrible fright. He thought to find me bleeding to death. To death? But why? Because my brother Ernst and his father nearly did. But I'm not that way, you see. What I told you makes the difference. And that difference has perhaps saved your life. Oh, Albert, how thankful I ought to be. Suppose you died before we got married. Could I have married anyone else? But you had to marry, dearest. You could not disappoint your people by not giving them an heir to the throne. Oh, Albert, shall I? Will that really happen? <laughs> we will hope so, dearest. In time. I hope it will be very soon. We really are married now, aren't we? Yes, Vipin. I think so. Yesterday seems like another world. All the crowds and the cheering and the bells. And now we are all alone. Just we two. Yes. All alone. Are you happy? Happy? Oh, so happy I can't tell you. And to think that this will go on for years and years. Oh, no, not just like this. That is not possible. But I shall never love you less than I do now, Albert. But you will be less excited, less uh, romantic about it. Today you have come to see me shave. You will not come to see me shave every day for the next 20 years. It would not be reasonable. But I don't want to be reasonable with you, Albert. But you will want, in time. You have a great life of duties to perform in which I am to share. Isn't that so? We can't share everything, Albert. Some things I shall have to do alone. Affairs of state, in which it would not be right for you to concern yourself. Oh. You must take great care, dearest. The English are jealous, and to them you are still a foreigner. And, uh, to you? To me you are everything. Life, happiness, peace, comfort. Hark! That is the band of my royal lifeguards. I gave orders for it to be here this morning, an hour earlier, so that we might hear it before we came down. It's very good music. Don't stand so near to that window, Vicky. Why not? The people might see you. But why shouldn't they? It would please them. Yes, too much. You are in your dressing gown. Besides, I want my breakfast. Please go and get yourself ready, quick. Order me to go, Alfred. Order me. Go, woman. He says to you, go. True to her promise and to her tender heart, the queen through the whole of her long life never loved her prince less than in those first shining days. But even marriages made in heaven have days that are less than heavenly. That is the prediction for a sunny morning in 1842, when the prince's secretary, Mr. Anson, is disturbed at his correspondence. Come in. Mr. Anson, sir. What is it? Her Majesty wishes to know whether the prince has yet returned. No. At least so far as I know, he has not. 
I'm told to ask, sir, whether you know where the prince is. No, I don't. It's very strange, sir. His Royal Highness's valet, Mr. Richards, says that His Royal Highness did not return last night from the Royal Academy dinner. Hadn't you better report to Her Majesty that His Highness is not here? That, I believe, was all you were sent to find out? Yes, sir, Mr. Danton. Immediately, sir. The prying fool. But where is he, then? Good morning, Anson. Oh, good morning, Your Highness. Any news this morning? In the papers, sir? Mm, the report of your speech at the Academy banquet, sir, it reads very well. Yes, it went well. Any letters? Uh, none important. Pardon me, sir, but Her Majesty... Yes, I know. I met her footman a moment ago. You may take these letters away and, uh... Albert! You may go, Anson. Yes, Your Highness. Albert! Where have you been? To Windsor Castle, Victoria. Impossible! Why did you not come back last night? I did not come back last night, Victoria, because of the way in which you sent for me. I told you before you went that I wished you to be back at half past ten at the latest. Yes. At half past ten you had not come, so I sent for you. Oh, yes. I received this note. Albert, it is quite time you were back. Please to come at once. But you did not come. I did not come because I was not ready to come. Albert? When you go anywhere without me, I do not expect you to be late. You knew my wishes. So, I sent another note. Yes. At 11 o'clock, I received this. Albert, I order you to return at once. Victoria Regina. And still you did not. I did not. So you disobeyed your queen. Yes, my dear. Sent me to the tower and cut off my head. I do not regard this as a subject for amusement and jest, Albert. No. Then it is lucky that I do, or we might have a serious quarrel about it. Albert, what did you do after I ordered you to return? Where did you spend the night? At Windsor, as I told you. I don't believe it. Don't you? Albert, I will not be treated like this. Sit down, my dear. Sit down. We will talk it over quite reasonably and comfortably. Now listen to me. When you married me, you made a promise that was strange for a queen. To love, honor, and obey. And because it was so strange, I've never told you to obey me, except in fun when you wished it. Now, my dear, there are some things in which you must not expect me to obey you. That is why I told the coachman to drive to Windsor. The coachman? What must he have thought? When we got there, he thought he knew the reason. There were lights and music and dancing in the castle. Music? Dancing? The servants were so sure we would be away. They were having a fancy dress ball. Two of them were dressed up like you and me. What an improper liberty. Most extraordinary. And how fortunate that you should have caught them. Oh, they were all very much surprised to see me. Indeed, I should think so. What happened then? Oh, <laughs> it was very funny. I tried not to laugh. I hope you did not laugh, Albert. Oh, no. <laughs> I composed myself to look very angry. But if, if such a thing could happen, well, it means that a lot of other things might be happening, too. I'm afraid so. I think, my dear, you had better make me your manager of Windsor. It will save you a great deal of expense. And if I did it at once, everybody would understand why. What are you smiling at? <laughs> it was funny. <laughs> and I'm so glad you went. What a good lesson it was for them, to be sure. <laughs> yes. A good lesson for them. <laughs> but why, Pink? You have not yet kissed me. Good morning. If you please. The queen who had been a child was learning to be a woman. But the early 1840s were hungry and restless years in England. And the child who was now a woman learned also to be a queen. Anson, is there any news? Sir, the inspector of police reports that they can't trace the man. He urgently begs that Her Majesty shall not drive out today. That is nonsense. 
If Her Majesty does not drive in the park as usual, the man will know that we saw him with a pistol yesterday. Then we shall not catch him. Well, it's, it's a great risk, sir. It has to be taken. The pistol missed fire. He does not know that he was seen. He will try again, and it is better to do it this afternoon when we expect it, than at some later time when we do not. But Her Majesty... It was her decision, Anson. When I told her the man was bound to make another attempt, she said that he had better make it at once and get it over. That was very courageous of Her Majesty, but, but well, don't you Very think... sensible. Tell the inspector we start at the usual time. Albert. Oh, my dear. You look very charming. And you're very punctual. Yes. We mustn't be late today. Come, Albert. <laughs> Look at all these friendly people. Waiting for you to smile on them. I am smiling. Of course. It is rather amusing that none of them knows in the least what we know. And it, this must be rather like going into battle. Except that we do it in cold blood, without any excitement. That makes it rather more difficult for us. But it excites me very much, Andy. For this is to be really a queen. And with you... I feel quite safe that I can behave like one. So do I, my chief. You never expected that you would have to do anything like this. But you do. It is heaven to do it that makes it possible. Look, Albert. Oh, my dear. My dear. Albert. The coffee. They've got the man. Kitty. They are cheering you. The people cheer you. Yes. Have I pleased you? You have more than pleased me. You have behaved like a queen. In a moment, Act Two of Victoria Regina, starring Helen Hayes with Carl Esman and Clarence Derwin. This is NBC, the national broadcasting company. Now, Act Two of the Best Plays production of Victoria Regina, starring Helen Hayes. The Queen is the mother of five children now, with four others still to follow. Other changes have taken place. Sir Robert Peel's government, which followed Melbourne's, has fallen in its turn to Lord Russell, and Victoria has taken her first journey by railway to the frightened despair of her master of the horse. But at Windsor Castle this evening, these things are not thought on. There is a concert in progress. But two ladies of the court have no time or attention for it. They are the Duchess of Sutherland, Victoria's mistress of the robes, and her young cousin, Lady Jane. But your grace, it is too difficult. My dear child, court life is difficult. But to be suspected, and for nothing, it's so humiliating. Lady Jane, anyone who touches the prince sets off a bomb. But I haven't touched him. No, but you've looked at him, and that is enough. Well, after all, your grace, he's there to be looked at. Why is she so jealous? She can't help it. He's possessive and she's in love with him. But I'm not. I wish she'd send me away. Oh, no, no, my dear. Hold your ground. And now, what exactly happened this morning? We were riding in the park. My reins got caught and the prince rode up beside me and was putting him straight for me. And the queen pushed her horse right in between us and she said, Lady Jane, if you don't know how to ride properly, you'd better not come out with us at all. And the prince said, Lady Jane, right... Power. May I? Oh, your highness, thank you. I am sorry. I, I'm sorry to have given your highness the trouble. No trouble. A pleasure. The color of the rose suits you very well. 
Alfred! What is it, my dear? Lady Jane, give me that flower. Your Majesty must pardon me. The flower is mine. How dare you speak to me? Go. Go instantly. Your Majesty, I... Go, I said. Your Majesty, do to allow me to speak, to explain. There is nothing to explain. But there is, there is. I saw everything. So did I. I saw the prince give her this flower. Do you mean to deny it? Your Majesty, he did not give it to her. She had dropped it. Dropped it? Oh, yes. No, ma'am. Quite by accident. It fell out of her hair. The prince only picked it up and returned it to her. You saw that, you say? You know that for certain? I assure your majesty it was so. Do you know also what happened this morning? Lady Jane has told me. It might have happened to anyone. It was a mere accident. It may have been a mere accident. I don't know. But what has happened tonight is much more serious. That is so. Your majesty gave yourself no time to think. I was too hasty, you mean. Does your majesty wish me to say more than I have said? I only wish you to tell me the honest truth. I will try, Mom. But the truth is sometimes difficult. It should not be. Not even when it is to a queen, Mom. A queen may need it sometimes far more than others. If she knows she needs it, Mom... She is already on the side of truth. I do know it. I do. Tell me. Is it possible that I have been a... I am sorry. Forgive me. I was quite wrong. Oh, you're not... Oh, there, there, there. And now, will you tell the prince? <laughs> I, mean, I mean, will you ask someone to ask the prince? Albert, I have asked Lady Jane to... Queen, my dear. With you to help me. Threatens to shake her world. Mr. Anson, has his royal highness not returned from the ceremonies at Sandhurst? No, your majesty. I wish he would come. This dispatch is very serious indeed. Is the messenger you brought it still waiting? He has gone, your majesty. Without staying for a reply. Yes, it causes is our fault, not theirs. Um, uh, cannot... One of your majesty's messengers go, ma'am, uh, the matter being so urgent. Oh, yes, he must. And, Mr. Anson, will you tell one of them to be ready to start at once? Yes, your majesty. Victoria. Oh, Albert, I've been waiting for you. Oh, Albert. Mr. Anson, the messenger. At once, your majesty. You have been so long, dear. And why did you wait to change? My uniform was wet through, my dear. And I was very cold. You're still cold, dearest. Your hand is like ice. Why did you go to Sandhurst in such weather when I begged you not to? I had to, my dear. What is the matter? Oh, it's about the trouble with America for having taken the Confederate envoys off one of our ships. And most wrong it was of them. But look, this is the dispatch that Lord Russell is sending to our ambassador in Washington about it. He wants it to go tonight. Is the foreign office messenger waiting? No, he's gone. Gone? Ah, that is what one has to expect now, I suppose. Yes, it's the Palmerston again, troublesome man. Yes. He and Lord Russell. Quite a pair. Read it quickly, Albert. I want to know what you think about it. The Majesty's government... Hmm. So. This means war. Yes, I was afraid so. How foolish of the Americans not to give in. They must know they are in the wrong. And everything that Lord Russell says is true, is it not? Quite. Quite. But it won't do. But Albert, as we are in the right, what else can we do? Alter it. Say it. But say it differently. Often it is just the way a thing is said that decides whether it will be peace or war. It is the same when two people quarrel. You and I often might have quarreled had we said the things we did say differently. Lord Russell. Oh, no. This is Lord Palmerston. But Albert... He would have war. And this time, we should win. But another time would come. And we should not win. But we could always beat America now, Albert. So. And after we are fighting someone else, Vicky... 
in America chose her time then. No, that is what these patriots never think about. It is always this time, this time we are right, and we shall do what we like. What fools their patriotism makes clever men to be. Palmerston. When he dies, they will say of this man, he always upheld the honor of his country. And when they say honor, they mean pride. And for this honor, we should send thousands and thousands to die. Oh, what a wicked black thing honor can become when men make use of it so. Then what are we going to do, Albert? We are going to alter this dispatch. Now, have your messenger waiting? Yes. Then go and write to Lord Russell Vicky. Say this dispatch is not to be sent until he has heard from you. I will. This will take me more time. But go and write your letter, dearest, at once. Yes, Albert. And then, will you leave me alone, my dear, while I do this? I shall try not to be long. <laughs> Every word. Then let it go. No. Yes, Your Majesty. See that this goes immediately to Lord Russell. Yes, Your Majesty. Why? Vicky. Albert, what is it? <laughs> I'm so... I'm so... Albert. Take me to bed. Please, my pin. Take me to bed. I'm... Ich fühle mich so schwach. Ich, ich konnte kaum die Feder halten. Albert! Albert! With half her life ahead of her, Victoria was alone. Alone, as Lord Tennyson wrote, to bear sorrow's crown of sorrow. Alone to rule by the guidance of her memory of what Albert would have wanted her to do. Never for a day to shed her garments of mourning, she yet returned almost at once to her duties of office. And so she grew old, and weary of London, took up her residence for longer and longer periods at her castle at Balmoral in the Scottish Highlands. There her ministers would come to report. There on a day in 1877, she talks with a good friend, her Prime Minister, Benjamin Disraeli, Lord Beaconsfield. My dear Lord Beaconsfield, pray sit down. I have that chair brought especially for you. Generally, I sit here in the garden quite alone. Such kind forethought, Your Majesty, overwhelms me. I gratefully accept. Well, and how is everything? <laughs> Madam, there is almost nothing to tell. Politics, like the rest of us, have been taking a holiday. So? This morning's news is not good, you know. It is not good. The Russians are drawing nearer to Constantinople. They will never enter it, madam. Oh, they mustn't, they mustn't. We will never allow it. That precisely is the policy of your majesty's government. Russia knows that we shall not allow it. England shall dictate terms, moderating the demands of Russia. And under your majesty's protection, the throne of Turkey will be safe once more. Ah, you are a true statesman, Lord Beckenfield. When Mr. Gladstone was prime minister, he never talked to me like that. No. You must have had interesting conversations with him, madam, in the past. I have never once had a conversation with Mr. Gladstone in all my life. 
He used to talk to me as if I were a public meeting, and one that agreed with him, too. So was there, then, any applause, madam? No, please, no. I used to cough sometimes. Mm. Rather like coughing at a balloon, I fear. Yet if there is one man who has helped me in my career, it is he. Indeed, Lord Beckenshield, how, how has he helped you? In our party system, madam, we live by the mistakes of our opponents. Many times have I trodden the road to power over ruins the origin of which I could recognize either as my own work or as that of another. And most of all has it been over the disappointment, the disaffection which my great opponent has left me to profit by. I gain experience by his errors. But only today I learn that he has been in the habit of addressing, as though she were a public meeting, that royal mistress whom it has ever been my most difficult task not to address as the most charming, the most accomplished, and the most fascinating woman of the epoch that bears her name. But, madam, I am here as your majesty's first minister of state. If you have any further commands... No, my dear Lord Beckenfield, I would rather talk with you as a friend. A friend. Those that we do not have to keep at a distance. You and I have not many. But while I have many children and descendants, you have none, I remember. So your case is the harder. I am not unhappy in my life, madam. Only so lonely. But sometimes I doubt whether I am really alive. Oh, no, my dear Lord Beckenfield, you mustn't say that. I apologize, madam. You spoke of your bereavement. I wish you would tell me more about your wife. To her, I owed everything. She was devoted to you, wasn't she? I never knew the depth of her devotion till after her death. Then, madam, and this I have told to nobody but yourself, then I found among my papers a message written a few days before her death, begging me to marry again. And you? Had you ever meant... Never, madam. It is enough if I allow myself to love. Oh, I understand. Madam, will you let me kiss your hand? My dear friend... There is just one thing I wish to say before we part. Speak, madam, for thy servant here. Have you any objection if I bestow on you the order of the God? That? I want your answer. What adequate answer can these poor lips make? Let me come to you again when I have saved Constantinople and secured once more upon a firm basis the peace of Europe. Then ask me whether I have any objection, and I will own I have none. Very well. Madam, may I propose a toast? The Queen, God bless her. <laughs> An old custom, madam, observed by loyal defenders of the House of Stuart, so that no lesser health might ever be drunk from the same glass. To my old hand came a sudden access of youthful ardor, which I could not restrain. <laughs> Your pardon. And may I now crave permission, madam, to withdraw? Go, Lord Beckenfield. You need to rest. Adieu, madam. Draw your curtains and sleep well. When pain and anguish ring the brow, a ministering angel thou. Adieu. Such devotion. Most extraordinary. Oh, Albert. Albert. Thank you. 
1897. Victoria, a tiny figure in a wheelchair, represents to the whole world the highest symbol of a great nation and an unparalleled empire. The crown she has worn for 60 years, she has worn in purest devotion to private virtue and public honor. And from the farthest reaches of earth, kings, princes, potentates and statesmen have assembled in London to do homage to her on this, her diamond jubilee. Now the long and brilliant ceremony of the triumphal procession is over. And ere the captains and the kings depart, let us see the queen once more in the large upper chamber at Buckingham Palace, surrounded by her children and grandchildren. Outside, the great throng of people still waits, and her oldest son, the Prince of Wales, is at her side. Are you tired, Mama? <laughs> Very tired, my dear, but so happy. So glad that, that I had the strength for it. May we drink to your good health, Mama? <laughs> Please, all of you. Your Imperial and Royal Highness. I, uh, I have great pleasure in asking you to drink to the health of Her Majesty the Queen. May she continue long in health and prosperity to enjoy the love of her children and her people. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Won't you go and rest now? No, not yet, not yet. My dear, people are expecting to see me again. I must try not to disappoint them. Will you go out on the balcony? Oh, yes, oh, yes. But I can't get up, you know. I can to go as I am. Let the windows be open and feel me out. How wonderful. How fun. I will retire now. How they love you, Mama. It is very gratifying, very, to find, after all these years, that they do appreciate all that I have tried to do for them, for their good, and for this great country of ours. We have been so near together today, they and I, all my dear people of England and Scotland and Wales and Ireland and the dear colonies and India from all over the world. I've had messages, you know, such loyalty, such devotion, such extraordinary, really. So, so happy. So. Oh, <laughs> Bertie, as we were coming back, Perhaps none of you noticed this. It was just at Hyde Park corner. There was a great crowd there, you know. And a lot of rough men. Of course, it ought never to have happened, but it didn't matter, really. Broke right through the lines of the police and the troops guarding the route. And they ran alongside the carriage, shouting and cheering me. And I heard one of them say, Go it, old girl! You've done it well! <laughs> of course, they were very unsuitable, the words. But so gratifying. And oh, I hope it's true. I hope it's true. <laughs> ah! They are still cheering. Oh, Albert. Albert, if only you could have been have just heard the best plays production of Lawrence Houseman's romantic drama, Victoria Regina. And here again is your host, John Chapman. Well, thanks to Arthur Houseman, Miss Hayes, Mr. Esmond, Mr. Derwent, and their fellow players, 
That was a fine beginning. For the sake of variety, next Friday we shall have a different kind of best play. Howard Lindsay's farce about the nightclub girl who was hidden in a men's dormitory at Princeton. She loves me not. Our cast will be headed by two excellent comedians, Eddie Bracken and Ann Thomas. This is Chapman saying goodbye until next week. Victoria Regina was adapted and transcribed for radio by Clarice Roth. Featured in the cast were Norman Rose as the narrator, Leona Powers as the Duchess of Sutherland, John Stanley as Lord Cunningham, Irene Hubbard as the Duchess of Kent, Robert Carroll as Ernst, Guy Spall as Mr. Anson, Burford Hamden as the footman, and Charles Francis in his original role of Lord Melbourne. Best Plays is an NBC production supervised by William Welsh and directed by Edward King. Fred Collins speaking. Tonight, listen for a Radio City preview on NBC.